So I think most people will agree that the 911, just out of the box, is probably one of the most capable track tools you can buy. And undoubtedly, the GT3 makes it even more special. And that being said, you probably are wondering the same thing I was when I was looking to buy one, which is, what's it really like to own and live with, especially if you've never been in a GT product before? So I'm gonna spend a little time taking you on a drive, giving you my first impressions, what it's really like to live with. And then I wanna do a deep dive around some of the details of the car and really do a walk around and hopefully give you guys all the answers you're looking for. So let's get to it. So welcome to my 2022 Porsche 911 GT3. And this is the 992 version. If you are familiar with uh, the chassis codes with 911s. Now, I um, got very lucky in getting this allocation because this is basically, it's basically a car you cannot get. <laughs> um, unless you're willing to really, really pay out the nose for it. And basically I had somebody back out of a allocation and the dealer called me because I was on a list and uh, I literally had like an hour to make a decision and so I jumped on it. But none of that matters. What matters is the car is here now. So what do I think? Well, first off, this is uh, still in its break-in period. So there's not gonna be any 9,000 RPM shifting today. Um, actually, all I'm really gonna do in this video is kind of give you guys a sense of what it's like to, to just drive this thing and give you a little bit of a detailed walk around. And then if you stick around to the end of the video, sort of a surprise announcement that I'm gonna make. So, uh, driving around town, what is this thing like? Um, quite frankly, this is very stiff. Now, I understand that this is a GT product it's also kind of built specifically to be a track tool and all that stuff. And that's part of what attracted me to the car. But I gotta tell you, like there is the thinking that the car is stiff and like your head, like you have like this just basic idea of what it would be like to own a GT3 and you expect it to be stiff. But I want you to take that concept and I want you to add about 250% more stiffness than you are, even think that there is, and that's how stiff this car is. Now, what does that mean? Um, I mean, I can definitely tell this is gonna be fantastic on a racetrack, but I only do racetracks maybe a couple of times a year, so the rest of the time it's on roads like this. This is just a normal drive that I would do. And I gotta tell you, like it's making me memorize where every single pothole is. <laughs> so if that's any indicator of how this car makes you feel when you drive it, then um, you know it should give you a sense because look, it's a great vehicle, but I'm finding myself weaving in my lane a little bit to dodge just even cracks and, you know, manholes and God forbid a pothole. And, you know, when you're really going fast, sure, it, it tends to kind of settle a little bit, but even when it does settle, I gotta tell you, it still um, reminds you that this is a very track focused car. So you gotta be willing to take all of your, you know, notions of what a car is, pass them to the side and recognize this is your stiletto. This is the shoe that you wear to the party for that one occasion. This is not the shoe you wear every single day. But on the flip side, when you roll into it a little bit and you hear that glorious sound, God, it's so good. And by the way, 
no matter what anybody tells you, and I don't need to go through all the stats of the car, I'm sure there's a million videos that you've probably watched on GT3s. I'm, I would highly doubt my video is the first one. So you've heard all the stats, you know everything about this car, you know what makes it different than all other GT3s and all that great stuff. So we don't need to go into that stuff. Other, other YouTubers have covered that better. But all I'm trying to tell you is, my initial impressions of this car, half of my expectations were met and the other half were not. <laughs> Meaning, this is just even more race car than I was expecting. And I feel like the last GT3 was probably 60-40 track car to street car. This is closer to 75-25. That's, I think I'm gonna leave it there. So as long as you're okay with that, that's fine. But I can tell by the way the roads are where I live, it's only a matter of time before I do some damage to the bottom of this car. Like there are diffusers and uh, air channels and all kinds of stuff for the brakes and for downforce going on underneath the body here. And this car sits extremely low anyway. So what does that mean? Well, it means that this car in particular, um, it, it's kind of flawed. It's not meant to be driven everywhere every day. Um, and that kind of sucks. Because <laughs> I was hoping it would be a little bit more daily drivable. Not maybe a seven out of seven days a week, but maybe like a four or five days out a week kind of car. And it's really not. This is a great like fourth or fifth car, I think. Um, and you know, the other problem is when I spec my car, I spec'd it for how I wanted to own it and drive it. But again, I only had like an hour to make up my mind. So I didn't have all the time in the world before the allocation was going to the next guy to make up more um, of an informed decision for how I'm gonna use it in real life. And so one of the things that really kind of sucks is these bucket seats, which I actually love. I think they're great. If you're buying a GT3, you should definitely get these bucket seats. But for my life, if I had gone with the sports seats, the sports seats allow you to be able to put a child seat um, and latch it on, a booster seat. And that would have been great because it would allow me to take my son with me, who is four years old as of right now, and he's a car nut, and he loves this car. And every single time I take it out, he begs me to take me take him with me. And unfortunately I can't. <laughs> so that is a real big drawback. So if any of you dads out there are thinking, oh, this will be fun um, you know, to get your kids involved in, just keep that in mind that you know how you spec it can actually make a difference. Um, again, GT3s don't come with a back seat, um, nor should they. But I think the touring ver version should make that an option. And I think that the touring version should also have different suspension because it's in the name, touring. It's not GT3 track, it's GT3 touring. So to me, that car should be softer. And though I love everything that Porsche does, I kind of feel that they got a little lazy with the touring version. They could have re-engineered some of the stuff and made that a special package for people to drive a little bit more daily. But instead, they just took this exact car and just took the wing off, more or less. So that made it, I guess, cheaper to create and produce and get um, approvals for. And hey, look, there's, there's business reasons behind it. I get that. But as an owner, I can see that that's a mistake. If that touring had been re-engineered a little bit more for uh, people like me who actually want to use this thing every single day with my family, that would have been the car I got. Um, so, you know, there's a little advice for you. If you're on the fence trying to figure out, you know, which version you should get. Which brings me to the next problem, dealer markup. <laughs> Now, by this time, you guys probably already know, like this is just the world we live in now. Cars are more expensive, both used and new, and car values are up. And so why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem when you're buying a car. It's great when you're selling one, but when you're buying a car, you know, you know you're gonna have to pay a certain amount above 
And, you know, look, everybody's gonna make that decision for themselves. But when you're buying a GT3 and the markup is so much money, like the latest numbers I'm hearing for a winged GT3 is about 50 to 100 grand, and it's definitely 100 or more for a touring, that should tell you like how high the demand is and also how far dealerships are willing to push for that ADM. One second so I can hear the sound. That is me shifting at six. So, that should tell you how much more motor this car has and also why that engine is so spectacular. Oh my God. Sorry, I just have to get that out every now and again. But man, for as great as that engine is, the suspension just beats you the hell up. It's kind of like the law of averages. It, for everything you're gaining, it detracts something, <laughs> at least on the road. I think on a racetrack and from everything I've heard, this car is super rewarding when you're on a track, super smooth surface and predictable surface. That is the key. Like right now I'm about to go left and there's this giant, uh, I'm gonna call it a dip uh, in the road. And if I were to go straight over it, which I'm not, I am pretty sure that front diffuser would touch. Um, that would be bad. <laughs> so don't want to rip this thing apart before I've even had it 500 miles. Um, but anyway, you're getting the point of this thing. <sighs> okay, so let's talk a little bit more about actually what it feels like to drive though. So you're very low um, and actually this seat can go even a little lower, but I just prefer this height. And I just love the, the texture of the race text, which is Porsche speak for Alcantara. And yeah, this, this interior is beautiful. And yeah, there's some complaints with like, you can't see the outside gauges that are right in front of you and stuff like that. But honestly, when you're driving this thing, you're not really looking down at those other gauges. You're really only paying attention to the rev counter right in front of you, that's it. And you know, the clutch has been, um, if you're getting a stick shift anyway, the clutch has been criticized for being a little bit, um, you know, like ha not having enough inertia. So sometimes you can stall these things pretty easily if you take your foot off the clutch and, you know, not be on the gas a little bit. But honestly, for me, that hasn't been a problem, but I could see how that would be a problem for somebody who's maybe not the best at driving a stick. Um, and I'm saying that in relation to the prior generation GT3, which had a heavier flywheel. And because of that, you could just lift your foot off the clutch pedal and the, the car would just start rolling forward versus here where you let off and you actually have to give it a little throttle. So there's a little bit of a balance there. Is that a big deal? I mean, to me it's not, but to others it might be. So that could be something to sway you into a PDK. The other thing is when you're moving on the road, you're gonna want to have two hands on the steering wheel because it is so darty. Um, like I cannot imagine having a cup holder, which you can put here by the way, um, and trying to take a sip of something while driving this. I can't even imagine that <laughs> because the chassis, the car is so stiff and you feel at any given time that it might dart to the left or the right if the road has bends and cracks in it. So, I mean, that's kind of terrifying. <laughs> so one more reason to just think about, you know, if a GT3 is really right for you or not, um, this is gonna make you work for the ownership. This is gonna make you pay for the things that you didn't realize you have to pay for. I'm talking about staying awake, being very engaged. And I guess that's part of why people buy GT3s for the engagement, but we're talking about even at low speeds. I mean, I'm doing 35 miles an hour right now, and I don't even feel comfortable driving with one hand. <laughs> so, so that's just something to consider. Um, the other thing is the braking. Um, I don't think you need carbon ceramics. Uh, maybe for a track, it'd be better, but 
for everyday use, it's pretty good, but bear in mind that for the US spec cars, they actually went with a um, worse compound for the brake pads. And the reason for that is because of brake noise. So Porsche, you know, I made a video recently talking about how their brakes squeal and that's part of the performance factor of those brakes that they put on all these all these vehicles so it's normal don't worry about it but i feel like most americans want everything you know to be silent and perfect and that's just not what you can get out of performance brakes so as a compromise i think they've changed the compound on the u.s spec steel brake cars versus the ones everywhere else in the world but for normal driving more than enough brake on a track i can see them maybe not being enough so you might want to consider if you're going to do track and you're going to keep the steel brakes there could be a reason for you to upgrade your pads at the least um, and just swap them out when you get there at the track and then swap back to drive home. I know I'm doing a lot of talking guys, but honestly, um, this car is, it's a fantastic car. I don't want to sound like I'm being negative on it. It's just, I'm being honest with you about it. it like Porsche has done some amazing stuff, amazing stuff. And the engineering behind this vehicle, I mean, it's breathtaking, worth every penny. But if this is gonna be your second car or even your first car, I, I just, mm, I just wanna throw up some, some, some red flags and go take caution. You cannot daily this thing every single day unless you have super smooth roads wherever you live. Oh, another thing, since we're talking about roads, um, right now, we just had a pretty good rainstorm and uh, there's still some standing water um, on these roads, even though it's sunny out. Well, the car comes with cup twos and these tires do not like the wet very much. They're not terrible, but I've had some, um, Scary moments is an easy way to put it. Uh, driving this thing even when the sun's up, but the roads are wet like they are right now. So I'm being a little bit more cautious. So, you know, just another reason to say this cannot be your full daily, um, no matter how much you think it can. Um, obviously you can't test drive these things before you buy them. And if the camera's shaking right now, <laughs> that's the suspension. Um, but God, man, this thing, it's something special though. The smells in here are just, uh, I don't even know how to explain it. They're just amazing. It, it, the, the, all the, the new materials in this car smell fantastic. And actually, wow, I'm going through a flooded road here. Uh, and actually the, the carbon fiber in here and the mix of, you know, the plastics, everything. it just, everything's high quality. Everything makes you feel like you're driving something special, even when you're going slow. I really think that that's a lot of the experience behind a GT3. And just for the fact that you can take it to the racetrack and have an amazing time, that's just um, icing on the cake. Oh, can I make a comment? This is 2021 and this is a 2022 model. Here's my gripe that I don't even believe <laughs> I have to say this, but in this year, it's not the first year we came out with backup cameras, but the reverse camera in this car is terrible. <laughs> like, like I don't want to gripe about stuff that is minor like this, but you know, all in, this is a pretty damn expensive car, especially when you look at, you know, paying a markup as well. So having a nice backup camera would really go a long way. And this camera, it's just, it distorts. Like it looks like a fish eye or something. And I, I just don't like it. I don't think it's the right, um, it's just not the right choice. However, they decided to do this um, from the factory. Um, one of the only other things that I think I would have a gripe with too, if you are specking out your vehicle, get the Bose, get that Bose sound system. Don't even question it. Like I know, 
you know, people uh, will say, well, you've got this awesome flat six, listen to that. Yeah, I got it. But you still need a stereo. Why? Because you're gonna take calls in here because there's gonna be times on long trips you just wanna be in six gear and listen to music or whatever. And one of the ways that Porsche made weight savings happen was they put in speakers with the tiniest magnets that I think are even possible in order for weight savings to happen. And that's great from a you know spreadsheet perspective and something you could boast about in the marketing to sell the car, but this is the worst, and I'm not kidding you, the worst stereo of any car I have ever heard in my entire life. It's that bad. Think about it like this. Take your cell phone, I don't even care what phone you have. Play some music uh, over the speaker on your cell phone. That might be better <laughs> than the sound that comes out of the speakers here. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know if I should be complaining about that because it's a GT product. That's the GT product side of stuff is the excuse for all of it. Basically, you have to say what you say, and then once you go, but it's a GT car, then that makes up for it. And I guess I'm just wondering if that's a good enough excuse because, you know, for me, I'm in about a quarter million dollars on this car right now. It doesn't have a stereo that I can even really listen to. And, you know, when I'm backing up, it's almost worthless using the camera. So I might curb the wheels, which I don't wanna do. I mean, these are just small things, but again, when you're into a car for so much, it, it really kind of sucks. The only way I can make, you know, myself feel better is just by doing that. Stepping into the throttle a little bit. Oh, and this gear lever. Oh, so good. It's so good. I don't know who ever complains about stick shifts and throws and all that stuff. Drive this you won't ever have a complaint about this car. This stick shift is so good. Oh my God, it's like perfect height, all that stuff, perfect positioning, you guys all get that. But with every shift of the car, I just feel like it's, I don't know, like I'm earning points on it. Like I feel like I'm gaining something from it. It's rewarding with every single shift. And it makes me wanna shift more. That's so good. And let me be clear, you cannot explore the limits of this car on the street. I mean, I think everybody gets that, right? I don't really need to say that, but I just did. You cannot. This thing has just amazing capability. You can feel it with every inch, with every movement. Like it's just, Ah, oh, it's so baked into this car, and you wonder, you wonder how they keep improving this thing. I mean, I thought the last GT3 was one of the best cars in the world, and really couldn't really be beat, but you know, here I am with this, and I'm going, no, oh, this thing is pretty damn good. Going into a driveway, so guess what? <laughs> Gotta put this up. Nose is now lifted. If you spec this thing, and you do not get the nose lift, um, I feel like you're in for a lot of trouble. Just get the nose lift, don't question it on this car. I do understand that on some vehicles, you know, like maybe a 911S or something like that, you don't need it. Um, the GTS, I don't think you need it, but on this car you do. That is how different this car is. So just take note of that. So we've actually had a lot of rainy weather these last uh, two, three weeks, actually. And this is one of the only sunny days and it is pretty beautiful out. Um, so it's just a good opportunity to walk around the car, see the car in the sun, which, I mean, this color is spectacular. And I will say this, shark blue is an amazing color, but 
in videos and in pictures, it just doesn't do it justice. Trust me when I tell you, the first time you see this thing in person, the color will stand out to you in a way that you weren't expecting. It is that beautiful. So with all that being said, let's take a walk around. The shark blue color is fantastic in the sunlight. I mean, it has dark blue and baby blue kind of blended and it just, oh man, it just stands out. It is one of the best blues I've ever seen on a car in my life. And by the way, I did own a Laguna Seca blue E46 M3, which I thought was pretty fantastic. This blue is much better. Now, one of the key things I did was I went with this carbon fiber roof. And, you know, you could see the weave really nicely, I think, in the sun. It is beautiful. Um, I mean, it just, uh, it, it just looks really, really nice. Now, I got it because I thought too much blue can be polarizing, so a little contrast might actually be a good thing. And I, I'm actually glad I did that. And I balanced the black on top of the roof with the stone guard. So that kind of helps balance the car out a little bit, I think. Now, mind you, stone guard is no longer available. Uh, for whatever reason, it'll probably come back in the coming months, but um, you know, I was lucky enough to spec it with that. And also keep in mind that the GT3 comes with this awesome side skirt. And I mean, look at how much it protrudes. It starts out nice and tight. And then by the back, it gets really, really wide. I mean, look at that. Um, and that just gives the car such a sexy shape because that balances out the hip. See, here's the hip of the car. Finally, you get to the wheel, and when you move forward, there is that side skirt. So just a really, really nice design. Really gives the car presence. Um, and I think, you know, it, it really helps sort of support the, the um, aggressiveness of what the car is intended to do. And you see that theme coming into the back here, uh, into the diffuser area. I mean, all these veins and splits and everything, they're all there on purpose. Nothing is here by accident. Obviously, everybody's talked about the wing to, you know, such an extent that I don't really think I need to go into it. But what's cool is, as the air comes over the top, it does funnel nicely right here into the intakes. On the prior car, the induction actually had a little bit of a cowl over it, kind of helping air go through. But instead here, they just have a reverse diffuser look, which actually sucks the air in as you're driving faster. So that's pretty cool. And that induction noise is super critical because in the car, you're actually getting, in the car, you're actually hearing a lot more um, induction sound than exhaust sound. I mean, you are hearing both, but like, I can definitely tell that they have engineered it so that there's more induction noise. Like, you step on the gas and it sounds like a, like a regular flat six, everything's fine. Then when you get aggressive and you really push it hard, not even hard, like, I'd say the second half of the pedal, that's when the induction opens up. And keep in mind, this car is sort of interesting. It has not six, but seven butterflies in the induction. There's one on each cylinder, and then there's one main one that distributes more of the air across uh, the inner induction uh, molding. So that's that's pretty cool. Also, I don't know if seven is a common theme with this with this car, but it also has seven oil pumps to make sure that this engine is always lubricated from every possible square inch on the inside under any G-force load, because that's a big problem with track cars, driving them faster on a racetrack, oil sloshes to one side or, or versus the other, and uh, you know your engine starts to starve a little bit, and that's not a good thing. Uh, so, pretty cool stuff, great engineering. Um, let's see what else we got. So, one more thing to consider is a car with center locks. Um, if you've never thought about it before, if you have center lock wheels, 
you have a challenge on your hands. <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty cool to look at and, um, you know, they definitely have their, their engineering purpose. But if you ever need to take the wheels off for any reason, you've got major problems because you need special tools to be able to do so. And there is a procedure that you have to follow to put the wheel back on. And it's about torquing it to the right specification, backing it off and then retorquing it. So like there's a, there's a little bit of a method there. And uh, most people won't have all the necessary uh, tools in their garage. Like if you're just like a person like me, if you have a shop or something, maybe you do. Um, but I'm just putting that out there because if you're driving to the racetrack in this thing and you get a flat, that's it. You're, you're, there's no spare tire anyway, but like on other sports cars where you might actually be able to use one of those, um, you know, those like inflate, uh, you know, those inflate tubes or whatever, um, just to get to a, a gas station or something. Well, here's the thing. You don't have that either. I mean, you have a flat, you're done. <laughs> so you're pulling over, you're calling a flatbed and good luck because you can't just swap in another tire. And, you know, I mean, look, it's at the end of the day, it's a very um, purpose-driven vehicle. So that's just something to think about, which I really didn't really consider until, you know, it was kind of like, all right, now I have the car. Oh yeah, what if I have a flat? <laughs> so, but anyway, not complaining. It's just something to be aware of if you're considering getting into, whether it's a GT3, a GTS, uh, maybe other models have it too. Okay. So <clears throat> I said at the beginning of the video that there was going to be a, an announcement and I'm going to make that announcement now because, um, you know, I, I wanted to kind of get the more or less first impressions side of the video done first. Um, but here we go. So I have owned this car for just about a month and I'm selling it now. Um, You know, <laughs> just saying that out loud um, pains me, I'll be honest. I love this car. I love it. Like, it's my dream car. And, you know, I work really, really hard. Uh, and, you know, nothing has been handed to me ever. I've, I've pretty much done whatever I could to be able to afford this car and other cars I've had in my, in my garage in the past and feel very, very blessed in those ways. But, some new things in my life have act actually dictated whether or not this is the right car for me today. And I kind of hinted to towards it in the beginning, but you know, I have two kids now, uh, two, year two years old and four years old, and both of them love cars. And you know, in my 1M and in my M2 competition, we would all go on drives together and they love it. They're car nut kids. And to me, that's really special. I'm not forcing cars on them, but they just gravitate towards that. And they love this car probably more than I do. If my daughter sits in this car, it's like a huge tantrum to get her out. And uh, the problem is I can't put my kids in this car and take them for a drive. That is my number one gripe of everything. And I knew that, you know, it's not a kid family car. I get that. So before commenters start giving me crap about that, that's not what I'm saying. It's just that when I was specking it, again, I only had an hour. <laughs> I wish I had put in at least the sport seats instead of the buckets, because though the buckets are my favorite, they um, do not do a very good job um, outside of the racetrack. And, you know, you can't use a car child seat in there. And so I can't take my kids with me. I mean, maybe if I kept the car for six to eight more years, my son would be able to come that's just crazy to say out loud. In the meantime, he's begging me to go for drives. So that is why, that's my number one reason why I'm selling the car. The number two reason is, you know, this car is expensive. <laughs> um, if I can't take my kids with me, that means I go on drives far less than I would like. And that means that this car is sitting in my driveway or in my garage, incurring a giant payment that you know, is just eating away at my bank account when I'm not even using it. So financially speaking, I think it's the right move from that perspective. And then also there is the demand. Um, I, you know, just being straightforward with you guys, I, I'm getting more money than I paid for the car. And I mean, look, that's great, but honestly, I wish I could just keep the car. Um, but if you're gonna sell a car, 
and you know it's kind of inevitable, the time to do it is when somebody's willing to give you the most money for it. And I, you know, in a year, this car might have, you know, four or five or 6,000 miles, maybe more. If that were the case, the car might be worth 40, 50, 60 grand less. So if I think it's gonna go at some point, the smartest thing to do is to sell it now. Um, and, you know, look, I, <laughs> I'm really struggling with it, <laughs> but I think it's the right move financially for my family. And there is good news as well, which is that if in the future I ever want to buy this back, once the hype dies down, you'll be able to buy a GT3, um, you know, used or probably even new for, I'm guessing, sticker. Um, and so that's that's pretty cool. So I, I feel good about that. Also, there are just so many amazing cars out there. You don't have to get stuck on one car and keep it forever. You can forgive yourself and allow yourself to go experience different things. And I am, and I'm planning to. So this car is now exiting my life uh, in the next week, but it's being replaced with something else. And I will show that to you guys in a different video. And uh, I also have one other car that's actually going to replace my replacement. <laughs> But that car is on order and it's gonna take quite a while because COVID. So um, I will kind of keep that in my back pocket, but at least there's other stuff coming that I think will better suit my family life, my just everyday desire to drive these things every day. And um, you know, just be smart with money. <laughs> so, all right guys, I know I just blabbed a bunch and uh, maybe this was more therapy for me than anything else. So if you guys have watched to this point, thank you so much. Um, I would say um, if you guys have questions or comments, happy to answer those in the comments. Um, you know, look, at the end of the day, if you guys are considering buying any of these GT cars, just go do it. You'll be happy. No car is perfect and it's not supposed to be. But I really do think that this is gonna be a car that anybody buys it, you will love it. You will find something about it that makes you smile. And what's that worth to you? Only you guys can answer that. So with all that being said, guys, thanks for watching. I'm Nick Saros. I'll catch you on the next one.